Hello, this is Pastor Kenneth Knotts. Today I want to bring a word from God to everybody. Um, it's it's an important word. It's, it's salvific. It definitely is salvational. Um, but first of all, I wanted to thank everybody for the prayers that we have been getting from you all who know that uh, my, my wife were up here in the Methodist uh, Hendricks Hospital outside of Plano, Texas. Um, uh, this is the Fort Worth, Dallas area where she's going to be having surgery to remove the bio duct mass and the ovary mass that she has uh, that is cancer. But we're trusting God that everything is going to be good in this and we're going to keep on serving her regardless. But anyway, this word I want to bring out um, is, is definitely salvational. Uh, the way to life, the way to salvation we have two ways. We have been taught here in the last 50 years that we just need to live our life, that we're, we're saved by faith and faith alone. It's the, it's the doctrine of the Reformation that we got from Martin Luther, John Calvin. Um, unfortunately, this doctrine did not come from them. This doctrine came originally from Augustine. And if you want to go back far enough, this doctrine came from Satan. That was, uh, that was his... His, his doctrine, his message, his teaching with Eve. He told her, he says, you're, you just live your life your way. You certainly, you're not going to die. And uh, this is pretty much the doctrine of the Reformation, just to live your life. Just believe. We're saved by faith alone, Christ alone, and grace alone. Um, unfortunately, that's not what the totality of Scripture teaches. So the way to life, I'm going to go through this and hopefully bring to light the truth of God's word that we can expose the deception that we are warned of by Paul, Peter, Jude, and John not to be deceived with. We're going to start with Proverbs 14, 12. And it says, There is a way that seems right to man, but in its end is the way to death. See, our way, our way does not lead to life. It seems right to us. It seems like the right thing to do. But it's not. Our way will lead us to death. There is another way, though. There's God's way. And that way leads to life. Our way leads to death. God's way leads to life. Jesus said in John 14, 6, this is Jesus' words, not mine. He said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus' way is the only way. Jesus is the Father. We, we know this from the studies that we've been doing here towards the middle of this year. But um, Jesus said, we do not believe that he is him, the Father, that he is the Father, that we will die in our sins. And this is salvific. So according to Jesus, we do have only one way to salvation. And that is the path to the Father is through Jesus. And this is the exact path that Jesus talks to us about, the narrow path. But in Hebrews 5, um, 8 through 10, this is the Apostle Paul talking, and he says, though he was the son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. This is talking about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, Jesus Yeshua, he learned his obedience by his sufferings. He learned the obedience to the Father. He lived a perfect life. He lived a life perfect in obedience to the Father's law. Now we're going to continue, verse 9. And having been perfected, he, he fulfilled the, the, the lawful requirement of the law by not disobeying it, by living it to perfection. He became the author of eternal salvation. To who? Read it. To all those who obey him. Called by God as the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus, Yeshua, didn't come for those people who disobey him. Jesus didn't come to bring salvation to those who do it their way. But he came for those who do it God's way. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. What is his voice? His voice is the word of God. 
And this is what we have in our Bible. In Jeremiah 7, 8, 10, we have something very similar to what we have going on today. The children of Israel, they had gone astray. They were in a state of backsliding away from God. And God, the Father, tells Jeremiah to come to Israel and to, to bring them a warning. And he's talking to Jeremiah and he says, Behold, this is verse 8, Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit you. You will steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and walk after other gods whom you do not know, and then come to me before me and stand in my house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do these abominations. This is today's doctrine of the church. We have God's temple is our body now. The temple of the Holy Spirit is us. And we go out and we commit adultery and we commit murder in our hearts. And we do all these things. We, we swear falsely. We react in anger. We refuse to forgive people. And these are all against God's word. We do these abominations before God. And then we come to him on Sunday morning. And we lift up our hands and we praise him and we worship him with blood on our hands. And that's exactly what he tells the children of Israel. You come to me and worship me with blood on your hands, with with fornication and adultery and, and murderous things in your heart. And he says what? Uh, he says that, he tells Jeremiah later on down here, he says in Jer Jeremiah 7, 12, just the next couple verses down, but go now to my place, which was in Shiloh, where I set my name in the first and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. Now, because you have done all these works, says the Lord, and I spoke to you rising up early and speaking, but you did not hear. And I called you, but you did not answer. Therefore, I will do to the house which is called by my name and which you trust in to do this place, which I have given you of your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh. And I will cast you out from my sight as I have cast out all your brethren, the whole prosperity of Ephraim. Ephraim. That was Joseph's son. Therefore, he's telling Jeremiah, therefore, do not pray for these people, nor lift them up a cry, a prayer for them, nor make intercession to me, for I will not hear you. Why will God not hear the prayers of his prophet Jeremiah? Because his people are not living in righteousness. Jesus tells us there's only one way, and it's the straight and narrow way. The straight and narrow way, the straight is the gate, it, the, the, the way is blocked, we can't see it, and, and tribulation is the path of salvation. This is our life as a Christian. It's not this easy, oh yeah, I'm just like having daisies and kind of throwing them around singing kumbaya as I walk through life. No, it's a life of persecution, it's a life of torment, it's a life of hardship. That's our life as a Christian. And Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many that will follow it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few that will find it. And we see in other scripture where he says, few. it's not that few will find it, it's that few will, those who do find it won't be able to enter because there's something that they cannot do. They cannot let go of themselves. They cannot die to themselves. They cannot humble themselves before God, and they cannot live according to his word. John tells us in John 9, 31, Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but everyone is a worshiper of God and does his will. He hears him. God don't hear the prayers of the unrighteous. So you think God's going to hear you in your time of tribulation, in your time of trouble, you're going to cry out to him and you think he's going to hear you. If you're not living a righteous life, 
in Christ Jesus, in him, God's not going to hear your word. It's only those who worship God and does his will. Two witnesses, not one witness, everything by a witness, two or three. And he gives us two witnesses. But anyone who is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. So with the two witnesses, we must worship God and we must do his will. We see also where Jesus says in Matthew 7, 22 through 24, this is a pretty scary verse. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many wondrous works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears my sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. See, it's not those who hear the word of God. Just like James tells us, it's not those who hear the word of God who are justified. It's those who do the sayings of Christ Jesus and apply them to their life. When Jesus says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the word, the mouth of God, that wasn't just a cute little saying. We are supposed to live our life and model it after God's word. That is God's will. Those are the people we hear, God, who hear, those are the people that God hear when we pray. God don't hear the prayers of the unrighteous. So these people, these people were, were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were walking in the gifts of the Spirit. They had no doubt in their mind that they weren't saved. They, they lived their life for themselves, but they did things in Christ's name. They had one of the two things that was required, and we're going to go into that here in just a little bit. James continues with that same concept. He said, but the doers of the word and not the hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone hears the word of God and does not be a doer, he is like a man observing himself in the natural face in the mirror. And he observes himself, goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not for a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, of the work, this one will be blessed. So the apostle, or the apostle James says, there's deception involved. If you hear God's word and you don't do it, you're living in deception. You're deceiving yourselves. But wait a minute here. The apostle Paul tells us something different. He tells us that we're saved by grace. So we're saved by faith through grace, not by works. But it seems here that James is telling us that it's those who do the works of the word that are going to be justified. And where is where is James getting this from? I mean, is this, this some new doctrine that, that James is getting this from? No, absolutely not. James is drawing this directly from Deuteronomy, what we call 11.26 through 28. And this is... Uh, God speaking to his people before they cross over the river into the promised land. He says, Behold, I set before you today blessings and curses, the blessings if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I give you today, and a curse if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord. But turn aside from the way which I command you today and go after other gods for which you have not known. So this is where James is getting this from. He's saying if you're a doer of the word that you will be blessed. But if you're not a doer, you, you're going to experience the curses. So this, this is not uh, contradictory to the gospel message. This is part of the gospel message. Now, Paul, we believe that Paul says that we're saved by faith and not by works. That's not where we get our salvation. Um, Paul says in Romans 2.13, this is Paul speaking. This is the words of Christ Jesus breathed through Paul. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law 
will be justified. So this is coming from Paul, the same person that we believe says that if we do any works that we're going to burn in hell because that's pretty much what's being taught. Um, Paul also tells us in Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Christ Jesus. Even we believe that Christ Jesus, that he might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law for the works of the law no flesh shall be justified none of us are going to be justified by the works of the law it's plain and simple i believe it paul says it it's true but we're misunderstanding what paul says so if we look at the totality of scripture let's see what james says about it but someone will say this is james 2 18 through 24 but some will say you have faith and i have works show me your faith without your works and i will show you my faith by my works you believe that there is one god you do well even the demons believe and tremble the, the, the demons believe but they're not going to go to heaven they have faith according to definition but do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? If your faith doesn't have works, you don't have genuine true faith. And it's only genuine true faith that's going to bring you to grace, that's going to bring you to Jesus Christ. So he says, was not Abraham our father justified by his works when he offered up his offered up Isaac his son on the altar? Do you not see that faith was working together with his works and by his works faith was perfected or completed? Completed is a better word. So it was through the works, Abraham's works of faith that completed his faith, making it full and alive abraham believed god and it was accounted for him as righteousness and he was called a friend of god you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone that's kind of contrary to the reformation reformation theology what does john have to say about it well, the second John four, second John one four through six, he says, "I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth." Okay, we ask, "What is walking in truth?" Well, John tells us, and he says, "As we have received the commandment from the Father." So, John uh, makes the statement and says that walking in truth is the same as walking in the commandments given to us by the Father. What are the commandments given to us by the Father? That's our Ten Commandments. That's the law given to Israel. That's God's Word. Who is Jesus? The, uh, the, he was the fulfillment of the Word. Jesus was the manifestation of the Word. The law is Christ Jesus. The same law that Paul's talking about, the same Word and law that James is talking about, the same law Peter is talking about, the same law Jude is talking about. He says, I see that you're walking in the commandments of the Father. Now he's overjoyed, he's greatly rejoicing that these people are walking in the commandments of God. And now I plead with you, lady, do not as though I write you a new commandment to you, but that which we have heard from the beginning that we love one another. The greatest, the second greatest commandment that we have. He said, I'm not giving you a new commandment, but I'm reminding you of a commandment that we already have. And this commandment is that we love one another. This is love that we walk according to his, the father's commandments. This is the commandment that, as I have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. We are to walk in love, first and foremost. But does that mean we ignore the commandments that give it, were given to us by the Father? Back during, uh, after Israel came out of Egypt, out of slavery? No, that doesn't mean we, that does not get rid of those commandments. Not at all. But we see that we still have to obey the commandments of the Father, 
but we also have to have the commandment of Christ, the doctrine or the teaching of Christ. And we're going to see what that what it is. John tells us this is love. Okay? It is love that we are saved by faith, and it's by faith only, not it's faith only that pleases God. But if our faith does not have works of faith, then our faith will no longer justify us before the Father. It is faith that pleases God. But if our faith doesn't have works, we're not pleasing God. We see there's two things from John. One is walking in truth, the commandments given to us by the Father. And the second that John teaches us and tells us is, it also have to have the testimony in Christ Jesus, our Yeshua, which is walking in love. It is love is the fulfillment of the law, not the end of the Father's law. Jesus didn't come to remove the Father's law. He came to fulfill the law. We must walk in love, but we must also walk in the commandments of the Father. And Jesus gives us an amazing uh what he tells us in Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill them. For surely I tell you today, till heaven and earth pass away, not one stroke of the pen or dotting of the eye will by no means pass from the law. None of the law, not the smallest part of the law is going to go away. Jesus says, don't even think, don't even think about thinking about that I came to destroy the law or to abolish it. He says, he gives us two witnesses, heaven and earth, and all things passing away. When, when all things are fulfilled, then there will be, the, the law will change. Um, and it, other than that, it's going to stay the same. Now there is a difference. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of the commandments. Okay, so he, Jesus says he didn't come to destroy the law. Now he tells us anybody who teaches men and breaks the least of the commandments shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches the least of the commandments shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so here again, we see two things. Obeying the commandments of the Father and the testimony of Christ Jesus. The fulfillment of the law is love. If we live in love, we're not going to harm our brother. We're not going to defile God. We're not going to defile our temples. We're going to live in we're going to live in harmony and peace with the commandments. We're going to love the commandments of the Father, just like David did. So we say, he said, we are, our righteousness, our righteousness, what, of our, what is our righteousness? Uh, our obedience to God's law. If our righteousness does not exceed that of the Pharisees, we won't enter the kingdom of heaven. What does he mean by that? What did the Pharisees do? The Pharisees obeyed the commandments of God to the letter. They, they were faultless as far as obeying the word of God. But what did they lack? They lacked the testimony of Christ Jesus. They lacked the testimony of Yeshua living in love. So they had the commandments part put down. They didn't have the testimony of Yeshua. They rejected Yeshua. That's why he was the stone that was rejected. Now in Revelation 12, 17, it's going to become clear here what we're talking about here. And the dragon, this is the end times, this is during the tribulation, and it says, this is John, his witness, and he says, the dragon was enraged with the woman. The dragon, that's Satan, that's the Antichrist. And he went to make war with her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of of Christ Jesus. So we again the two witnesses, two things, the commandments of the Father and the testimony of Yeshua. Okay? These are two things that we need to have for salvation. Okay? Two things, the two witnesses, the commandments of the Father and the testimony of Christ Jesus. But what is the testimony of Christ Jesus? Are, are we told ever in scripture? 
Yes, we are. And continuing in Revelation 19, verse 10, And I fell at his feet and worshipped him, because, uh, but he told me, the angel, See that you do not do this thing, that I am a fellow servant, and I am your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. The testimony of Yeshua. Worship God for the testimony of Yeshua is what? The spirit of prophecy. What is the spirit of prophecy? What is prophecy? Prophecy is the word of God. What is the fulfillment of the word of God? The law? Love. Love is the fulfillment of the word of God. What is the spirit of prophecy? The spirit of the law is love. The spirit of God's word is love. So he say, he's telling us the testimony of Yeshua, the testimony of Christ Jesus, is the spirit of the word of God, which is love. Pretty simple. Pretty simple stuff. So we see that there's two ways that we can walk our life. One leads to life. One leads to death. If we don't obey God's word, we are living in deception, just like Peter and Paul repeatedly told us, don't be deceived. Beware there's going to be false teachers who are going to bring in heresies into, the, into Christ's church. Don't believe them unless they bring the exact doctrine and teachings that we bring. You reject them or you're going to share in their curse because they're bringing forth heresies of not the truth. Leading people astray, making merchandise out of the people, out of the God, out of God's sheep, out of the out of Yeshua's sheep, making merchants. There, there, it's a paycheck. It's a paycheck. I'm not teaching you what you need for salvation. I'm teaching you what you want to hear. I'm tickling your ears so that the lie sounds so good, and that's exactly what Satan did with Eve. Can you not see that the, that fruit is good for food, it's pleasing to the eye, and it's wonderful that it's going to bring you great wisdom and make you as as God. You're going to know the difference between right and wrong. You're going to, you're, and God's just holding back from you. This doctrine is not a new doctrine. This doctrine was back from the beginning with Eve. Satan's MO hasn't changed. It's the same thing, same doctrine. It's just been revived through the Reformation, through Martin Luther and John Calvin. Two ways to live our life. Our way, our way will send us to hell. If we do what's right in our eyes, God does not hear our prayers. That's not my words. That's the word of God. You heard it. You read it with me. If we do it God's way, he hears our prayers. We live in faith. We live in obedience to his word. And we live the testimony out of Christ Jesus. So we live in love. And it's through that love that causes us to obey the commandments of the Father. So to sum it all up, I'm going to end there. We need to really be conscious that we line everything up in our life according to God's word. We are to live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So we're presented with a situation in our life. What do we do? Do we do it our way? No. We go to the Word of God. We find out what the Word of God has to say about that situation in our life. And then we model our life after what the Word of God says. That's why James tells us it's the doers of the Word, not the hearers, that will be justified. All right. We love you. We wish the best for you. Thank you for your prayers. And we'll see you later on. Thank you.